Good, uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, Philip Munoz. I direct the Center for Citizenship and Constitutional Government. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you. It's delightful to be back in person. So thankful we are back uh, in person together. And we have a terrific panel to start uh, the semester off with. Um, as you know, uh, the center uh, has a fellows program. And one of the fe things our fellows do is uh, they meet with our speakers. Several of our uh, fellows are going to be meeting with Congressman Lipinski after uh, this session. So if for the students here, if you're interested in uh, participating in the life of the center, um, uh, meeting our speakers, uh, getting to work with our faculty, I encourage you to look into uh, the fellows program. Right? And let me just uh, repeat, I've been asked to repeat, there's, we have master in the back if anyone uh, in, needs them. Um, a few thank yous. Uh, thank you to Tim Bush. Uh, thank, I should welcome all those who are uh, watching online. We're having trouble with the live stream, that's why we've started late. Um, watching uh, online live or, or recorded, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, I wanted to say thank you to my friend Tim Bush, who introduced me to uh, Congressman, uh, Congressman Lipinski and uh, helped provide uh, the, the funds to bring the congressman uh, to Notre Dame today. Okay, uh, Veronica Masca, a senior uh, constitutional studies minor and business analytics major, is that right? Is going to uh, introduce our speakers. They'll each speak for about eight to ten minutes, and then we'll have lots of time for discussion among the panelists and uh, uh, Q&A with the audience. Veronica. Thank you, Professor Munoz. To start introducing our panel, I'll begin with the far side of the table and the order of our speakers. Sharif Gurgis is an associate professor of law at the Notre Dame Law School, a position he has held since 2021. Prior to joining the Notre Dame faculty, Professor Gurgis practiced law at Jones Day in Washington, DC, where he focused on appellate and complex civil litigation. Before that, he served as a law clerk to Justice Samuel Alito of the United States Supreme Court. Now completing his PhD in philosophy at Princeton, Professor Gurgis earned his JD at Yale Law School after completing a master's degree at Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar. Dr. Christina Woolbrook is a professor of political science and the C. Robert and Margaret Hanley Family Director of the Notre Dame Washington Program, as well as an affiliated faculty and the Gender Studies Program and a faculty fellow at the Claw Institute for Civil and Human Rights. She has written widely on women's suffrage and women voters, including two co-authored books, A Century of Votes for Women, American Elections Since Suffrage, and Counting Women's Ballots, Female Voters from Suffrage Through the New Deal, both through Cambridge University Press. She is co-editor of the journal Politics and Gender and of the book series Cambridge Studies in Gender and Politics. The Honorable Dan Lipinski served eight terms as a U.S. Representative for the 3rd Congressional District of Illinois from 2005 until 2021. Representative Lipinski earned his bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Northwestern University, a master's degree in engineering systems from Stanford University, and a PhD in political science from Duke University. He taught at none other than Notre Dame from 2000 to 2001 before joining the faculty at the University of Tennessee where he remained until his election to Congress in 2004. Representative Lipinski is a pro-life Democrat and served as co-chair of the Bipartisan Congressional Pro-Life Caucus. Please join me in welcoming our three panelists today. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thanks to Philip for organizing this and asking me to do it. Um, thanks to all of you for showing up, to the co-panelists for, for joining, and thanks for the introduction. I still wince when I hear the words completing his PhD. So the one thing you can't ask me in the panel is how, um, how my dissertation is going. Um, I am very excited to talk about this because I think it's the most exciting Supreme Court case in 50 years. And the reason I think that to just cut to the chase is that I give it about a 90% chance of overturning Roe v. Wade. So I'm gonna limit myself to the legal issues and leave the political questions uh, to my co-panelists. And in talking about the law, I'm gonna limit myself to reporting and predicting or explaining my predictions. I'll report the kind of very quick history of abortion jurisprudence and 
the arguments at issue in this particular case, and then tell you exactly why I give it 90% chance of overturning Roe. Most of you probably know how the history begins. It begins in 1973 with the Supreme Court's decision in Roe v. Wade, which declared that there was a fundamental right to an abortion under the 14th Amendment. So the due process clause of that amendment says, you can't deprive anybody of life, liberty, or property without due process. And the court had long said that, even though that makes it sound like all we're saying is you can't, you have to give the people a fair trial and notice and so on before you take away their rights, there are some rights that you just can't take away at all. There's a substantive component to that due process clause. And one of them is right to privacy. And in Roe v. Wade, the court said that the right to privacy includes the right to decide whether to uh, end a pregnancy. At the time, the, the court was widely panned by legal scholars on the right and on the left. So um, a very strong supporter of abortion rights named uh, John Hart Ely, who is the dean of Stanford Law School, before that a professor at Harvard Law School, said the problem with uh, Roe v. Wade is that it's not constitutional law and it gives no sense of an obligation to try to be constitutional law. And Larry Tribe at Harvard Law School said behind its verbal smoke screen, it, the basis for its judgment is nowhere to be found. So it was, it was panned for not having a, a, a good grounding in legal sources. But by the time that the next big challenge to it came, which was in 1992 uh, in Planned Parenthood versus Casey, the court at that point at least had one legal argument to make in favor of keeping abortion rights, which is precedent in Roe itself. And so the, the arguments focus to a large extent on whether they should stick to the precedent in Roe, and they mostly did. So Roe v. Wade had said, because there's a fundamental right to get an abortion, you need a compelling interest to justify any abortion regulation. And the court also said, in the first trimester, there's no compelling interest. In the second one, there's a compelling interest only in protecting the mother's health. So you can get incidental regulations, you know, that, that regulate clinics and providers and so on, but no bans. And then only after viability is there a compelling interest in saving the fetus's life. So it's only at vi after viability, which is around 24 weeks of pregnancy, that you get to ban abortions. Casey stuck to most of that. Casey said, well, we agree that you have to have a compelling interest for any abortion law, and we agree that you don't have a compelling interest in saving fetal life until after viability. So under Casey and Roe, there's no abortion bans are allowed after, until after viability around 24 weeks. Um, Casey did lighten the restrictions on some other aspects of what Roe v. Wade created, but that's not relevant to, to Dobbs. Um, so where does that leave us in this case? At issue is a 15-week abortion ban. So Mississippi has banned abortion, almost all abortions um, after 15 weeks. It's made exceptions for uh, health emergencies for the mother and for what it calls severe fetal abnormalities. But otherwise, if you want an abortion, you gotta get it before 15 weeks. That obviously runs afoul of Roe and Casey because the one thing they both maintained clearly is that you can't have abortion bans start until 24 weeks, which is viability. So what's the court gonna do? Well, the arguments on both sides are pretty much as you can imagine them. So the defenders of the law, or sorry, the challengers to the law say, this law is clearly unconstitutional under Roe and Casey. Those are precedents. There's a good principle that says, this principle of stare decisis that says you should stick to precedents unless you have a very, very good reason not to. And you don't have a good reason not to here. You considered all the reasons in Casey, you rejected them then. That, that creates an extra layer of precedent that should block any attempt to, over, to, to get rid of Roe v. Wade and Planned, per, Planned Parenthood versus Casey. The, and in particular, women by now have had what the court calls a reliance interest in having abortion access, which means they've come to rely, they've made, they've made all kinds of choices that depend on the ac accessibility of abortion, and if you take that away from them now, you're thwarting their reliance. You're, you're making it you're making them worse off than they would have been if these precedents had never existed because they made these decisions that only make sense if abortion is available and now you're taking that out from under them. So that's the reliance argument. On the other side, the, the defenders of the law, Mississippi and a bunch of amici, are saying, look, Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey are so egregiously wrong, so ungrounded in legal text or history or precedent or any other source that they do pass the test for overturning. 
And besides that, the reliance interests at issue here are not the typical reliance interests the court is worried about in other cases when it doesn't want to overturn a precedent. Because reproductive planning can take immediate account of any change in abortion access. Basically, you could use contraception. Um, everybody observing the case agrees that the court is going to uphold this 15-week ban. The only question is whether it's going to go all the way to saying that states can ban abortion from conception. Is it going to do that? Or is it going to find a way to draw some new line? Remember Roe and Casey draw the line at viability, 24 weeks. To save the 15 week, you got to save the 15 week ban, you have to pull the line back to somewhere between zero and 15. Is it going to do that? That's the question. Before the oral argument, my basic reason for saying there's I don't see how they can do that, is that it was very hard to see a legal argument for a new line between zero and 15 weeks. Why is that? Well, this kind of court is a lot more formalist. It likes grounding its decisions in legal sources compared to how Casey and Roe courts were. So it's gonna to wanna to be able to cite something. It can't cite the text because the Constitution doesn't talk about abortion explicitly. So there's definitely not gonna be an explicit basis for a line between zero and 15 weeks in the text. It can't cite precedents because again, the, the main precedents on the books, Roe and Casey are flatly inconsistent with this law. So if you're gonna uphold it, you gotta scrap the precedents, replace it with something else. So what is the new line and how can they defend it? Well, one possibility, so in other words, you can think of it as what special things happen sometime after conception, but before 15 weeks, so that the court could say that's the new rule. Some people say, well, something special happens when the baby has a, when the unborn child or the fetus, depending on your view, has a heartbeat, which happens around five or six weeks. The problem is if we cut the constitutional right down to that point, it's basically a right to take the morning after pill because a lot of women aren't even finding out that they're pregnant until then. So if you're looking for some kind of compromise, it's not much of a compromise. And also, it's impossible to find a legal source that supports that. It has some intuitive appeal for some people, but you can't cite a law book in favor of it. So some people say, all right, well, maybe not, uh, maybe, not via, maybe not a heartbeat, but the capacity to feel pain. That's a new state interest that comes into play. When the unborn child or fetus can feel pain, then the state has a new reason to regulate, which is to prevent the experience of pain. And there are a bunch of problems with that possible basis in this case. One thing is most people who think there is a point at which the fetus feels pain think that it happens a bit after 15 weeks. So it happens too late to save this 15-week law. But the second and more fundamental problem is that it's, it's a clear rule of constitutional law that you cannot ban exercises of a fundamental right for the sake of a goal that you could achieve by less restrictive means. So you can't keep saying abortion is a fundamental right and allow states to ban it to prevent pain that they could just as well prevent by requiring fetal anesthesia as some jurisdictions already do. So pain's not gonna help you. Some people say quickening. Quickening is the line. Quickening happens around 15 or 16 weeks, and that's when the pregnant woman can feel fetal movements. And the reason that's supposed to have legal authority is that for centuries at common law, the law created by courts that we developed, that was developed in England and we inherited in the colonies, you were allowed to criminalize, abor abortion was criminal only from the point of quickening. So if a woman had an abortion after quickening, she could be subject to criminal penalties or the provider could be, uh, but not before that. And some people say that means there was a common law right to an abortion until 15 weeks. But there are a bunch of problems with that, with that answer. One is that even when criminal bans could only start at 15 weeks or 16 weeks at quickening, before then abortions were subject to other legal burdens. So it's hard to say that there was a perceived right to those. They were subject to burdens like, for example, the fact that if the, if the baby happened to be born alive, however temporarily, and died, or if the mother died, then you could be subject to felony murder for the abortion, which means that the abortion itself was seen as something unlawful, such that even an accidental, perfectly innocent and accidental causing of a death could get you on the hook for murder. Another thing was that contracts to procure an abortion even before quickening were illegal, were deemed illegal and unenforceable because they were unlawful. Um, it was unlawful to advertise abortions even performed before 15 weeks and so on. None of this is consistent with the idea that there was a right to pre-quickening 
abortions. So the history of the common law thing won't help you for that reason. And the other reason is, even if you disputed that, by the time that the 14th Amendment, which is the part of the Constitution we're, we're interpreting here, was ratified in 1868, more than three quarters of the states had banned abortion from conception. So the states that ratified the 14th Amendment obviously thought it was okay for them to ban abortion from conception, so it's hard to say that they thought there was a right to abortion before quickening. What other basis is there? There's one other argument, which is the one that the Chief Justice floated at oral argument. And that is to say, well, maybe let's go back to Casey. Maybe Casey does leave room to uphold this law. So Casey says you shouldn't, have, you shouldn't impose an undue burden on abortion access, and maybe this law doesn't do that. It doesn't impose an undue burden because it leaves the pregnant woman up to the 15th week to decide. So as long as it leaves her a fair window to decide, there's no undue burden, therefore it's okay under Casey, and we don't have to get rid of Casey to uphold it. The problem with that is that it fundamentally misreads what Casey meant by undue burden. The undue burden test itself hinges on viability in Casey. Undue burden doesn't mean you've left her too narrow a window for deciding. It means you've made abortion too hard to get at a given point in time, any point until viability. That's the thing that you can't do. So obviously, this law doesn't just make abortion hard to get at some points before viability. It makes it impossible, illegal to get. So if you said we're upholding this under Casey's undue burden test, it would be wordplay. You're basically embracing a rationale that just rhymes with something in Casey. So if you did that, you'd basically be making up a new rule of your own. You'd be opening yourself up to the criticisms that people have leveled at Roe itself, which is that it made up a new rule without any basis in legal sources. And moreover, you would be doubling down on a new abortion right, because you'd be having to justify it in your own voice rather than relying on other sources. So it'd be very hard to come back in a later case and overturn it, because at that point, you're not only contradicting Roe and Casey, you're contradicting what you said the day before yesterday in Dobbs. So since the premise of the middle ground was supposed to be that this would be a way for the court to look lawyerly and avoid politicization and leave itself room to keep chipping away at Roe later on, it would be self-defeating. It would actually look arbitrary and therefore increase the political uh, appearance of the decision and it would double down on whatever new right it, it left in place. Those are the reasons I thought that there was no way they'd go halfway. The only question was whether they would strike down the law and say Roe and Casey are still good, or uh, uphold the law and say there's no constitutional right to elective abortion. State can allow abortion, states can ban it, but it's up to them. The final nail in the coffin, in my view, the thing that brought me from 70% to 90% was the oral argument itself where, Chief, where Justice Kavanaugh, who's widely thought to be the swing vote in this case, said, basically telegraphed to everybody that he was, in my view, in my interpretation, that he was going to vote to overturn Roe and Casey and send the abortion issue back to the states uh, with respect to bans at, at any stage. So that's my prediction. It's made on tape now, so you can embarrass me in a few months if it turns out to be wrong. But I look forward to hearing about the, the political implications, which are way above my pay grade. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, yes, I think we've done a good job here of setting out different agendas. Um, so thank you for that. Um, uh, here's the thing. Um, I taught Introduction to American Politics in the fall of 2015, and I explained to my students that I was a professional political scientist, a student of political parties, and there was no way the Republican Party would nominate Donald Trump for president. And so I am officially out of the prediction game. I don't, I don't do that. Um, and it's really not in my job description as a social scientist. What I want to talk more generally is, is sort of background about thinking about abortion um, as a legal issue and a political issue in American politics that'll give us some suggestions, not predictions, but some things to look for as we think about what impact there might be if Roe is overturned or not overturned. And I want to talk about two in particular. So I'm going to talk a little bit about American federalism, and I'm going to talk a little bit about American party politics. Um, so the current estimates from the Guttmacher Institute is that if Roe is overturned and is returned to the states, as was just said, that as many as 25 or 26 states will enact uh, bans on abortion. Um, as you might be aware, a number of states already have 
uh, on their books, uh, laws that say if Roe is overturned, this becomes the law. Um, uh, a number of other states have signaled that with other sorts of laws, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we're gonna have about half of the states in which abortion uh, is banned entirely or close to entirely, and half the states where um, under different laws, um, abortion is permitted. In doing so, if this was to happen, it's going to contribute to a general trend we're seeing in federalism over the last 30 years. And that is that states, particularly democratically controlled versus Republican controlled states, have moved farther and farther apart in their policy regimes. Now, states have always been different. That's kind of the point of federalism, right? Um, and so there's a bottle bill nine miles up in Michigan, but we don't have a bottle bill here. I, I grew up in Oregon that started the bottle bill thing, so I have to talk about that. Uh, that's required, right? You can gamble in Las Vegas, but uh, not in other places. And of course, there's been much more serious differences across the states. So most political scientists would have uh, characterized the uh, American South in the first half of the 20th century as a non-democratic authority regime, for example. Um, and so we see these sorts of differences. What we've seen in the last 30 years as sort of partisanship has uh, increased, polarization has increased, is a similar pattern in the states. And so today, the degree to which you are governed by environmental uh, uh, regulations, the degree to which you have access to the ballot, the degree to which you have access to Medicare, Medicaid, or other sorts of health policies, uh, the rights of labor, the, light, the rights of LGBTQ folks, are gonna vary dramatically depending on which state you live in in the United States. Um, and of course, we're seeing those ballots, uh, those battles play out in politics um, all around us. Now, of course, for lots of people, this is the success of federalism, right? The, the very idea is that there should be more local control. Laws can be more responsive to the, the citizens um, in those states and their personal preferences, right? This, in some sense, is sort of good democracy. At the same time, right, the, the rising sort of concern about uh, dramatic inequality across the United States, um, as well as concerns for some fundamental rights, right? Should your access to the ballot be so much a function of what country, uh, excuse me, what state you happen to live in and um, uh, which political party controls um, your state? There's also concerns, of course, that prohibitions um, on abortion will put additional pressures on public health, uh, foster care, and other systems. Often in states, um, the ver those very same states um, are often lower in terms of their resources and capacity in public health and in, in sort of government agency um, in general. Um, there are currently about 800,000 um, abortions per year in the United States. It's an open question as to what will happen to that number um, if, if Roe is overturned for a whole bunch of reasons that we can talk about. Um, and so, and I should also say that rate is consistently falling, not because of restrictions, but, but rather because just the number of pregnancies in the United States is on decline as well. Um, so, so we see sort of, we can sort of understand Roe and the possible impacts it's gonna have on federalism is part of this sort of broader uh, sense of polarization at the state level and sort of distance in uh, rights and regimes um, depending on the state that you live in. I wanna talk in a little bit more detail about um, party politics and thinking about the impact of abortion on elections, on, on party competition, et cetera. So since about the New Deal, the main division between the American political parties, the, the two that we have, has been broadly speaking about the size and the function of the federal government. Um, as you probably know, Democrats prefer more interve intervention into the economy to address sort of uh, the failures of human flourishing associated with laissez-faire capitalism and to protect marginalized people, uh, while Republicans tend to, tend to favor a smaller state that is less government, less government intervention, um, and an un and a more unfettered economic system. Uh, issues of race and civil rights, which have always been central to American politics, were actually originally uh, orthogonal to sort of that debate over the size um, of the government. I can talk about why that might have been. It has to do with a lot with the South, which was very conservative on civil rights, but very liberal on things like, yes, we will let you build bridges and NASA and other things uh, in the South to bring sort of government programs uh, and wealth. Uh, to our states. In the 1960s and 1970s, right, the division between the parties on these issues of, again, how active should the federal government 
B, become even sharper with things like Lyndon Johnson's Good, uh, Great Society programs, um, uh, ex uh, expansions of Medicare and Medicaid, or creation, I should say, of Medicare and Medicaid, um, et cetera, at the same time that these issues become more tightly uh, intertwined with race. So uh, there's great research showing, for example, that pictures and images when we were talking about social welfare programs in the 30s, 40s, and 50s are mostly poor white rural folks. And by the 1960s, everyone thinks of, of uh, wealth, social welfare in terms of benefits to uh, 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 poor uh, black uh, folks in cities. Um, and that's going to have all sorts of consequences for uh, party politics in a lot of interesting ways. Enter abortion, right? Uh, particularly with uh, the Roe versus Wade uh, decision in 1973, but of course, abortion had sort of been churning under, uh, uh, I'm losing my analogy, let's just go with churning, um, since at least the 18, uh, since at least the 1960s, when the thalidomide crisis and a number of other high profile cases drew attention to um, abortion as an issue. This was largely framed in the 60s before Roe as a public health issue. Um, as, and, and most of the advocacy was coming from physicians who were concerned about the medical and health threats to women who were um, accessing abortion at that time. I want to emphasize this. Abortion was not originally a partisan issue. As most of you probably know, uh, as uh, governor of California, Ronald Reagan signed um, one of the first liberalizing abortion laws in the country. George and Barbara Bush, so the first George Bush, uh, were longtime very strong supporters of Planned Parenthood in, in Texas. Um, on the other hand, both Al Gore and uh, Joe Biden uh, originally had, were um, strong pro-life uh, voters and had, and had taken uh, pro-life periods uh, 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 stances early in their careers. Two things happen to public opinion and party politics following uh, uh, Roe in, um, in, in 73. One is that, so we have this model of the Supreme Court, and I think this is relevant, we're talking about here, right, where the Supreme Court says something, and we're all like, they're in that big fancy building, they're wearing robes, and they weren't elected, so it must be right. Um, we actually call that the Republican schoolmaster. Like their job is like small, small R Republican, right? Is to come and explain to you, this is how to be. So the power of the Supreme Court saying separate is inherently unequal, right? That becomes something we know and it has a weight to it, right? Abortion, well, and so people have shown in a number of different kinds of case areas that when the Supreme Court makes definitive decisions like that, it shapes public opinion. People think differently about these issues. That's not what happens with abortion. What happens with abortion is that most people hadn't thought about it a great deal. It wasn't something we talked about in polite company, right? And people who already lean pro-life became much more pro-life, and people who were leaning pro-choice became much more pro-choice. Okay, so the first to say is that we get this sort of, we, we thrust it out there, people are thinking about it, my God, it had never occurred to me, you see these stories about public opinion in the 70s, like I can't believe that we would ever allow this or we would ever just, you know, uh, uh, becomes quite broad. The other thing that happens, as I said, is it's not initially partisan, and I want to emphasize this as well. The shift to abortion becoming a partisan issue happen, happens initially at the elite level, which is not surprising because that's where most of things, those sorts of things happen, which is to say mass opinion throughout the 70s remains pretty divided. There are Republicans, uh, people who identify as Republicans who are also pro-choice. There are people who identify as Democrats who think of themselves very much as being pro-life. The parties move apart for various reasons. Um, and unfortunately, I could talk about that at length, but I won't because I only have a minute or two left. Um, but the short version would be Republican operatives, I, that sounds like it's a bad word. I don't mean it's a bad word. That's their job, right? People who are thinking about how can the political party win votes see a population that is not only worried about changes in abortion, but there was that school prayer decision in the 1960s. There's uh, 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 growing concern about LGBTQ rights. Like all these sorts of things are a threat to what is understood to be sort of the uh, uh, sort of an established way of life, um, and and the reaction to that. Right now, 
people react to events in lots of ways all the time. They don't always have to react politically. But with the help of a number of um, Republican activists who saw this as a political opportunity, right, we get the rise of sort of what's called all sorts of things, the religious right, the new right, et cetera, right? These are people motivated by their concerns about threats to traditional families, traditional social norms, um, et cetera. Democrats, on the other hand, are eager to sort of grab this new socially and politically active uh, feminist group, and they move in sort of a different uh, direction. Unless, if, if, well, I, I don't know why I think you did. So it is really actually not until 1980, so seven years after Roe versus Wade, that the parties take definitively distinct positions on abortion. Um, Repub the Republicans for the first time say that they're going to appoint pro-life judges, et cetera. Democrats say they're going to do the opposite. I want to, that process, I should say, takes a long time, which is why it's so perfect that Representative Lipinski is going to follow me, because I think part of what you're going to talk about is exactly uh, this question of how the parties sort themselves out. But I want to make just three comments, and then I'll, I'll finish up. Um, one is that the, re the relationship between abortion and partisanship goes both ways. What do I mean by that? I mean, as, as the cues that voters increasingly got from their parties, pro-life, pro-choice, whatever that might be, happened. Some people really deeply cared about the abortion issue and they might have shifted to one party or the other, right? Remember, lots of different issues, always sort of hard. As, my, as our colleagues, actually, Professor Lehman and a number of co-authors have shown, however, what we also saw is people shifting their opinions to suit their party. People like me, Right? who I seem to agree with on all these other things, are telling me abortion is bad, abortion is good, abortion is fine, you know, whatever those sorts of things might be. We also see this other way, which people who might have joined one party or the other for more, uh, those sorts of moral issues things go, well, I guess I also don't like taxes, right? Like, I, I, I'm here because I care about abortion, but I'm gonna, you laugh, but there's lots of data to show that's exactly what happens. Um, I want small government, um, all sorts of, all those sorts of things. So, why does this matter? One, Abortion and these, and these culture war issues are part of a general sorting of the American public, where today most people's identities as Catholic, as white, as middle class, or whatever it might be, as uh, 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 a person of color, as um, a churchgoer, et cetera, sort of line up in ways that reinforce identities and a sense of belonging. Um, and that is absolutely at the root of sort of the strong, even maybe kind of productive, uh, sort of partisan divide that we have in politics today. Not only are the parties farther apart, but this sense of that we're all on one team and we hate the other team, right? I don't want my daughter to marry into the other team. I don't want to eat, those are also survey questions we ask. I don't want to, you know, uh, there's nothing good about them and the world will end if they're elected. So anything I want to do to win is probably justified because they are so inherently evil, right? That, that sort of teammanship has a pretty corrupting impact on um, uh, elections and the reaction to them, right? So thinking of things like January 6th, right? That you are justified if the other team winning is such a uh, unbelievably bad uh, uh, outcome. I swore I was not gonna go over, but I'm gonna say two more things. One, I think abortion plays a really unique role in this and, and, and is one of the challenging things, right? So I started by saying, we used to argue about the, the size of government. In some sense, you can, you can sort of, um, you can compromise about those sorts of questions. How much environmental regulation? How, you know, we all agree that basic, basic worker safety should be a good idea, but how much regulation, right? Or I want a lot more money spent on schools and you want less money spent on schools, but we can sort of negotiate that, right? Abortion doesn't work that way. Right? Now, there are certainly some sort of division in the truth of the matter is, as most Americans are somewhere in that fuzzy, mil that fuzzy middle. But it is for many people a do or die if yes or no sort of an issue, right? And so it makes the kind of compromise that is required in a democratic system incredibly difficult. I'll say one more thing about abortion um, compared to other culture war issues. It's interesting to compare abortion uh, to the cases of uh, gay and lesbian uh, rights. We have had the sharpest change in public opinion on LGBTQ issues in the last 30 years of almost any other issue you can think of that we've been tracking in terms of public opinion. Um, 
there are lots of reasons for that, and we could go on length about uh, that shift in public opinion as well. Um, I would argue that one of the reasons is that um, we see that shift, but more positive shift in attitudes towards uh, LGBTQ Americans at a time in which the main discussions are about marriage and service in the military. Those are two of the most fundamentally conservative institutions um, in society. Um, and the degree to which these groups are seeking to not challenge, but to integrate themselves into traditional American institutions, that is much more appealing uh, to many Americans. Abortion is still seen as a challenge to traditional institutions um, and to motherhood. I'm going to stop talking there. Thank you. I want to thank uh, Philip Munoz and uh, Tim Bush and Napa for bringing me here, and it's great to be back. It was it was so nice for uh, Professor Wolbrick to uh, welcome me as a former colleague. Uh, 21 years ago, I was a visiting assistant professor here, and all of you can say it's uh, well. Professor Gurgis has a um, is talking about you know being worried he hasn't completed his doctorate. Just remember that you were here when he is on the Supreme Court. And you could say you remember back at Notre Dame, and you knew him back then. Um, yes, I am. I'm a rarity, uh, maybe an enigma. I'm a pro-life Democrat, uh, but I'm also, if you listen to my bio, an engineer and an anti-political scientist. So that's a bit strange, also. Um, I am. Uh, I'm going to be out in Washington next week for the and uh, speaking at, at at the March for Life. So you definitely know where where I'm coming from, um, and I'm very hopeful that um, this will be the last year that the march has to be in the middle of the worst, you know, the middle of January in Washington D.C. Because if Roe's overturned, there's no reason to hold have to hold it at this time of year uh, on the anniversary, and uh, it's oftentimes extremely cold. Um, so we often hear, um, and, and look, if, if one bad prediction, you know, ruled out you ever making a prediction again, there'd be no one on, none of these pundits would be around, um, on TV or writing, uh, who supposedly know politics and understand it. Uh, so, um, but I sort of feel like, now, now I'm supposed to be making the, the predictions, which uh, I, as an engineer, I'm risk averse. Um, and for years, people talk about, oh, this is going to have a seismic shift, cause a seismic, seismic shift in um, partisanship. And it's hard to think of things that have. You know, 9-11 lasted for couple years in terms of carrying the Republicans, but um, most things usually have not. This could, and I'm not saying it will, it could. Uh, so let me start by saying this is not something, and as I started talking to more people about this, there's a lot of different opinions on what happens. Uh, either way, if Rose overturned, or it's it, it's not overturned. Um, so Christina gave a great uh, background on how the parties sort of have, um, you know, become very clearly Republicans, pro-life, Democrats, pro-choice. At least at the elite level, still 25 to 30 percent of Democrats, when polled, will say that they are pro-life. Um, but, uh, and the other thing is, I, I think it's important to point out, I, I always have to keep reminding myself, especially for, for students here, uh, the last five years have been much more stark on this uh, in terms of, I mean, President Donald Trump was the first president, first Republican president to really very strongly uh, push policies, Supreme Court justices, and talk about being, in addition to talking about being pro-life. That was different. And the Democratic Party has become more radically, um, look, back in 2004 when I was first elected, the, 
Democratic Party had in the party platform, abortion should be safe, legal, and rare. And you would n pretty much never hear that today out of most Democratic elected officials, candidates, rare. Uh, so things have gotten even more, uh, in the last five years, things have changed. I think a lot of it had to do with, with President Trump and uh, him really making this an issue. And a lot of people, here, here's the other thing, I never thought there would be a day when we'd be, the possibility of Roe being overturned. I didn't think it was ever really gonna happen because there's been talk about it since Ronald Reagan was, was, was president. Oh, the Supreme Court's gonna, Republicans are gonna appoint to the Supreme Court justices, they're gonna overturn Roe. I never thought it was gonna happen. And you talk to a lot of people who've been in the pro-life movement for 50, 50 years who say, I still don't believe it's going to happen. Um, even though there's a 90% chance, we're, we're told, that, that it will happen. <laughs> you leave that 10%, though. Um, so w first, let's start. Where, what do Americans think? Six in 10, uh, in, according to a Gallup poll last year, six in 10, 58% of Americans say they support Roe v. Wade. Okay, so 58%. However, a NORC poll, AP NORC poll from last year, showed that 65% of Americans believe that most or all pregnancies should be illegal after the first three months of pregnancy. Right? Those two don't fit together. There, people don't, a lot of people don't understand what Roe v. Wade says. I think a lot of people, I'm sure there's a good number of Americans who think if Roe v. Wade is overturned by the Supreme Court, that means abortion is now banned in the United States. Uh, so just keep that in mind. You know, the, the support for Roe v. Wade versus 65, two-thirds of Americans say after the first trimester, uh, which is a couple of weeks short of the 15-week ban in the, in the Mississippi law. So we have... Three possibilities. I'll still say three possibilities. Um, the Mississippi law is upheld as constitutional, and Roe v. Wade and Casey are, are overturned. Or it's up, the law is upheld, and there's a modification. Now, no, it doesn't make it does. There's no real legal justification for that. However, was there a legal justification? I mean, couldn't. They, they found uh, the 14th Amendment to, you know, create this, uh, the, the right to an abortion uh, in Roe. So I still don't put it beyond. writing the opinion. And I think that's a great, I, it, that makes sense. Um, so those are two possibilities. The other possibility is Mississippi law is struck down and Roe and Casey upheld. So a lot of, you know, what, what happens? Well, let's start with the law is, is upheld. Um, politically, some Democrats, probably secretly want it to be upheld because they think it's a great political issue uh, going into the, the midterm elections where things are looking very bad right now for, for Democrats. And I expect that Democrats will run on this um, issue if the Mississippi law is, is upheld. Um, and it's going to be the support for Roe, and that will, that will be it that, you know, we need to, now that Roe Ro is gone, we need to pass, well, the House already passed a, a bill last year. The House passed a bill, all Democrats except one voted for it, to basically make legal, it basically set abortion on demand up till birth in this, uh, in this bill that was, that was passed the House. It didn't, everyone knew it would come up in, in the Senate. I wrote something in, in public discourse about how this is, a, this is a very radical 
uh, radical bill and sort of out of step with really where the American people are at. But they will go that way because they, they talk about it as up, we're codifying Roe. And like I said, six in 10 Americans are, say they support Roe, even if they don't understand exactly what it, what it means. So I expect the, the Democrats to, to go that way. If the law, Mississippi law is upheld, I think the Republicans, some Republicans are going to want to say, in Washington, are going to say, oh, let's leave it to the states. Because they don't want to touch it. They've been afraid. A lot of them are afraid to touch abortion. They'll, they'll talk about it. And uh, I, I've warned people in the pro-life movement, if Roe is overturned, you're going to you're going to find out that some of, uh, some of your friends in the Republican Party are no longer there uh, because it wasn't, it was, it was really hard being a pro-life Democrat. It's hard not to be a pro-life Republican. Uh, does this change now? I think there are a lot of, re now I wouldn't sh shouldn't say a lot. There are some Republican members of Congress, Republicans who would basically campaign, yes, I'm pro-life, and with a wink to the Democrats to say, oh, but we can't do anything because, uh, because of, uh, of Roe, because of the Supreme Court. Um, and honestly, so, I, I, so what do, I, I don't think Republicans can get away with that. I've had some people say, well, that's what the Republicans in Washington are going to do, say, we always told the states, you'd, you know, we'd give this back to the states and we're going to do that now. I don't think that the pro-life groups, pro-life movement in general, pro-life voters are going to sort of, be okay with that. Uh, I've talked to a leader of one of the most powerful, probably pro-life groups involved in, in politics, who said the, uh, what the message is, is going to be uh, is es essentially really go in on, okay, we need to have a 15-week ban at the, at the federal level. And if Republicans get the majority in the House, they can past that, that's what they're going to promise. The Senate, assuming the filibuster is still around, if the filibuster is gone, I, I don't think it will be gone, but with the threats this week about the filibuster being gone, maybe it opens up the you know, possibility of having 50, 51 votes in the Senate uh, for a 15-week ban. Um, so what does this do? I mean, what how does this impact politics, uh, in partisan politics? First of all, abortion has played a really outsized role when it comes to congressional elections. And I'm a perfect example. Um, I would, th there's $3 million in 2018 spent by pro-choice groups against me to defeat me in the primary. I barely won. They spent at least that much in 2020 uh, when I lost. Congress has done very, very little when it comes to abortion because there hasn't really been the opportunity to, to do it. And there, there's been a real fear all the time by some, you know, many Republican leaders about doing anything uh, because they don't want to touch the issue because they think it's too red hot. They've got the pro-life voters. So why actually raise this issue an, anymore? Um, in, in, in fear of it being a political loser. But what, what happens? I, I think if the Mississippi law is upheld, uh, and I, I, I think it all, how does it impact partisan politics? I think it depends on what do the Republicans do. Uh, I think politically, the, the smartest thing for them to do is if they get you know, they, they go out there and be aggressive and say, we will support these restrictions on abortion. We will support laws. We will vote for bills to create laws to put these restrictions on, on abortion and dare the Democrats in restrictions that are highly popular. You know, that, if they focus on that, I think that could shake up politics. Um, do Democrats, uh, I and then if, the only things, things are really going to change, I think, if the Democratic Party sees being pro-choice and the positions that they take in terms of if they oppose restrictions that are generally popular in, in the country, 
they oppose those and they see that being, they wind up losing and they think they lost some seats because of that, maybe the Democratic Party starts saying, okay, we're going to be more open to pro-life Democrats. The, the party's not, not going to change to become pro-life, but maybe an opening for that. But I think it's only going to happen if Republicans very smartly are able to you know, say, These are, this is what we're going to do in terms of, of restrictions. Now, the problem the Republicans are going to have is there are going to be Republicans who say, okay, now we're going to, Republicans in D.C. in Congress are going to say, we need to ban abortion altogether. And we're not settling for anything less than that. We're not voting for these some restrictions, we're going to ban abortion altogether, which is not a popular in this country right now. And so that's the risk that they're going to face. I think a lot of Republicans probably want the Supreme Court to uphold the Mississippi law, but figure out some way to say, okay, 15 weeks is, is now what the Constitution says. Uh, you can ban abortion after 15 weeks, but before that you can't. They're, and that would cut off the members of the Republican Party who really want to push this and make it a shorter, you know, point out a ban before 15 weeks. Uh, I think there are some Republicans who probably would like to see that because in, in, they think that's going to help them most politically and prevent sort of this becoming a, again, going to, is it about, all or nothing on abortion. They're, you know, the threat that Democrats always said about Republicans is they're going to they're going to ban all abortions. Um, so that's if the Mississippi law is upheld. So let me be brief on this last part. But this is probably the most interesting. Okay, say the Mississippi law is struck down, Roe and Casey are upheld. What does that do to politics? Are there going to be pro-life voters who say, I've had it, which nothing's ever going to change, I quit? Um, from either saying, I'm not going to get involved in politics anymore. Republicans have promised for years, for decades and decades, and this was our chance to overturn Roe, and it didn't happen. It's never going to happen. They check out of politics. They stop, stop voting, or they no longer, maybe some of them start voting for Democrats. They say, well, nothing's ever going to change on abortion anyway, so uh, we're going to do that. Or even be more radical and say, I give up on America. America's irredeemable, which is very concerning. Uh, and... I'm surprised at the number of people in the pro-life movement who I talked to who said, not going that far, but, go, but saying, this is it. If Roe's not overturned now, I give up. We need, the pro-life movement needs to turn somewhere else, turn its energies away from politics, uh, because this is, we're never going to get anywhere with this. That could have a big impact. If that happens, uh, pro-life voters overwhelmingly vote for Republicans. If that's no longer going to be the, uh, the case, that will, could make a big difference also. But again, this is something that no one knows because we haven't seen anything you know, quite like this. Uh, and a lot of people, again, I, I can't emphasize how... If you're a student right now, you have no idea how people who are who have been in this involved on both sides of this issue for decades, how they feel about this, and never thought this day might come. Uh, and so we'll we will see what happens, but it, it could be, although I'm not predicting a big <laughs> side shift in partisan politics. I'd love to see it one for many reasons, but I'm going to shut up right now because I could go on, and there's a lot of other things that Christina brought up that uh, I think are very interesting and important about uh, the, the, the parties. But this could have an impact either way. 
on, uh, on, on partisan politics. Thank you. All right, thank you to all our uh, panelists. Um, uh, I should give you a chance to comment on one another's, and let me just th put my own question out to, uh, on the last thing that uh, the congressman said. Uh, if, if I understood you right, the, the greatest, so if Roe is not overturned, uh, Roe and Casey are not overturned, uh, uh, an, an exit uh, from politics among pro-life conservatives would destroy the Republican Party or destroy, you know, it significantly weaken it. Uh, you, Christina, do you concur? And Sharif, you want to get on on this? So there's more to lose uh, uh, for Republicans, is what I took from the, the panel. I'm not smart enough to turn that off. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you did. I know. I, know. <laughs> I didn't know. Um, so I, I really appreciated the congressman's comments, um, and I, I thought they were really, really smart. And I and I agree. I, I, it's important to say that you know there, this is a theological debate about whether or not the the work of particularly people who are against abortion on religious grounds, um, what what is the responsibility? Is it your job to change this kingdom? Is it your job to prepare for the next? Um, and, and certainly that was a, a, a popular view in a number of large Christian denominations in the middle of the 20th century, that, that politics is a separate thing and we, we build the kingdom here. And, and I do agree with Professor Limkinski. I don't have any, uh, professor, sorry, uh, with the congressman that there are, um, that we don't know, but that's certainly not outside of the possibility. Um, a sense that not just on abortion, but on a lot of issues, that we've lost the culture. And so our job is to build sort of our own communities in those sorts of ways. The only thing I would add to that is, is and it was the, the one thing I actually didn't get to, is it would be interesting to see, and I, and I really appreciated the, the distinction about you know, uh, each party sort of uh, their, the, the, the political dangers of being too extreme, right? that uh, full abortion any time is not po popular, but neither is a complete ban. Um, it will be interesting, right? So in the, in the 70s, the reaction was, we've, we, we have lived for the last five decades since the end of World War II with this sort of family and these sorts of arrangements, and these new things like abortion are threatening to that. Well, now we've had 50 years, um, I appreciated the explanation of sort of the, the thinking about that in legal terms, in which people expect that abortion is, is part of sort of the range of healthcare options that exist. And so whether or not that then generates more activism on the left. Traditionally, we knew that pro-life pro voters are much more single issue voters. I don't care about anything. I want to elect pro-life people who put in pro-life judges, but that has not been as true on the pro-choice side. It would be interesting to see if that switches. We have a tradition here. Oh, go ahead, please. Yeah, yeah. yeah, actually, I just heard there was a poll just, I heard it this morning about how uh, Democratic voters, 13% now say abortion is, I don't know if it's a top issue, an important issue. Mm -hmm. uh, this year compared to like 1% or 2% in the poll last year. Uh, so just right to, right to your, your point there. The, the other thing is if, they, if the pro-life movement gets out of politics, it, it's talking about, you know, moving more to winning hearts and minds, but also doing things for women uh, who are in unplanned pregnancies. That's going to be an issue if, if it's overturned. If Roe v. Wade is o overturned, you're going to see, and there's been talk about doing, understanding a lot more needs to be done on the non-political level by you know, these pro-life pro groups, and I think no matter what, you're going to see even more of that. Uh, there's a lot going on, but even more of that no matter, no matter what happens. Okay, wh one more question for the panel. Uh, raw politics here. Who's more energized if Roe is overturned? <laughs> All right. Um, it's, I think it's a relative, I think you have to, consider it relative to how much they would be energized without it. And so I say Democrats, because Democrats are facing more, Republicans are motivated already, uh, just because they're, they're out of power. And so it will help Democrats more in that way in terms of mo motivation. Okay. At the state level as well? Uh, I think that it, yeah, because, I mean, unfortunately, ever, so much of politics has become federalized. You know, everyone sees everything as a, a federal 
issue or connected to federal, federal issues. So I think it works at the state level also. And there, there's so little split ticket voting. I, I would agree with that. Um, I, I think that threat is a really important motivator. And um, when you have the status quo, you have the status quo, and actually our entire system is set up to sort of keep the status quo. And so I think the left is going to be really motivated by a sense that they've lost something that they expected to have um, for, such a, for such a long period of time. I do think, again, the overreaching is important. The sense that this is part of a broader agenda to attack things like contraception, et cetera, that are so widely used. One of the issues with abortion is it's often kept hidden, right? Almost 20% of pregnancies end in an abortion. Um, it, it's uh, it's uh, uh, something that's much more common, but because it is so hidden, it's harder sort of for people to see that, right? Uh, this is one of the, the things that also, of course, helped um, uh, gay and lesbian right politics, which is the AIDS epidemic made it clear to people how many um, of their, uh, their friends and family members um, we're, we're gay and lesbian, and we know that those sorts of experiences really change views as well. And so the dynamics of that, um, one of the things I didn't say is, is similar to the first abortion thing. What's going to happen is, especially in today's media environment, is there's going to be the woman who gets a back channel abortion and is in serious medical harm or has a, a serious medical problem but can't get across state. Those sorts of things that are going to, I think, really fire up this debate. I, I <clears throat> that, that's where all my initial intuitions were. The one caveat I would lodge is that, um, you know, for, for months we heard in the media and, and elsewhere that Texas had effectively nullified Roe v. Wade within Texas, one of the largest states in the union. And the, in the Virginia governor's race, for example, McAuliffe tried to make a big deal of that and say, you know, they're coming after your rights and so on. And I think the reaction to it was so much more muted than I was expecting, and the juice that he seemed to get out of it or not. I mean, people were a lot more worried about, you know, Dave Chappelle's Netflix <laughs> specials or about, you know, it, to compare, for example, the reaction when Indiana expanded its Religious Freedom Restoration Act protections a few years ago. There was a huge uproar and boycotts and NCAA taking tournaments out of the state and so on. And there was nothing like that in Texas, which is the one thing that has made me wonder if my initial instincts aren't, aren't quite right. I want to agree about that. I want to say, though, as in everything, and you'd be shocked, we haven't used this word yet, I think COVID complicates everything, mm. right? So I wonder if without arguing about mask wearing, right. there'd be more space for that. But that's a, I don't know the answer to that question. Yeah. So we have a tradition in the program as we invite our undergraduate students. Um, I'm going to bring the mic to you. I ask you two things. One, to introduce yourself, where you are at Notre Dame. And keep, we don't have a whole lot of time, so keep your questions very short, please. So any students with questions? Students, students, students. students we were OK. Oh, come on. <laughs> Uh, hello. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, my name is Luke Kanishnik. I'm a junior and a Tocqueville fellow. Um, my question is for Congressman Lipinski. Um, and you said that if um, the pro-life movement, say, exits federal politics, if Roe is failed to be overturned um, in June, um, would it? Do you think there'll be energy from the movement to focus on state level, more state level restrictions, or will those just the or will they see that that's not possible with Roe continuing to exist? I think it'll just be a general um, thinking this is, this is all, all, po all politics is, is worthless. Uh, we, it, there's no reason to be, be involved. We're not going to make a change. So I think it, it'll impact, um, it will impact, you know, state, certainly. Uh, and the question would be where do you, do these same people put their energy into something else in some other, in, in some other issue, per, perhaps? Which would be interesting, because I, I always give this as an example in classes that um, uh, pro-life movement was quite brilliant about this, right? For, for the many decades in which it was clear the Supreme Court wasn't going to move, they concentrated their efforts in, in other places, right? So trap laws, um, all sorts of limits on abortion at the state level, which is not, which has now set them up for this particular case, right? It's a very long-term strategy. Um, uh, hi, I'm Tommy Garnett. Um, I guess this is a question for everyone. 
you guys had mentioned how like most of America might not understand necessarily the implications of overturning Roe and like a lot of like regular voters may view it as just an attack on federal ban on abortion in general. Do you think there'll be any movement to like uh, educate the voters more on what the actual effects of overturning Roe is? Like, do you think the Democratic Party might want this ignorance to like remain and use it as a political tool? Like, is there any way out of kind of the ignorance of America about the actual effects of overturning Roe? Uh, that's something that the pro-life movement is, and uh, Republicans, if they're going to really get active, are going are gonna to have to do. And it, it's going to be very interesting to see if how successful that that, that, that is. Um, but yeah, uh, that's, that's a big question. Are, are people, and how long will that take uh, so that people realize, okay, if Roe's Ro gone, what does that what does that really mean? And it doesn't mean all abortion are banned. So that's going to be fascinating to, to see public opinion on, on that and what people understand if that's his decision. Can I ask a question to follow up on that? Is there a sort of sensible compromise middle ground that you foresee happening? I mean, so some states were banned. Some states will be abortion on demand. What about, will there be a middle position uh, in some states? And what would that look like? What states, maybe? I, I think one obstacle to it is uh, something I learned just in studying this case, which I didn't realize, which is that right now, already, 95% of abortions happen before 15 weeks. So uh, a huge number of them happen quite early, which means that in order to give the pro-life side something that feels like a tangible victory, you have to cut the right quite early. But then as a rhetorical and political and practical matter, that's going to feel like too early for the for the pro-choice side. So it's, it's hard to imagine the line, though I guess, you know, based on the polls, maybe, maybe um, as long as people don't realize how many abortions happen early, the first trimester is, the, is a natural option. Well, one other thing very quickly, there are some people who think that uh, abortion is such a big issue in the U.S. compared to other Western countries because other Western countries have basically come down to a middle, a middle ground, like this first trimester. Uh, legal after that, it's, it's not legal, and that calms, that calms things down, and it's not as big an issue in, in other countries. So I don't, it's not going to make everyone happy, uh, but maybe that make, would make a difference. I, I, I want to make sure everyone's comfortable. Uh, if you have classes to go, meetings to attend, please just, uh, w uh, we'll stay for some more questions, but if you need to leave, please feel free to do so. Okay, let's open it up to everyone here. Mr. Lipinski, I'd like to take you back to the days right before Obamacare passed. Yourself, Bart Stupak, and a few congressional Democrats were holding the deciding votes because you wanted the Hyde Amendment put into the, the statute. President Obama said no, but he would keep it alive from executive order. So what was going on through your mind during those days? And in your opinion, did Obamacare lead to federal funding of abortion? And if so, do you think that President Obama lied when he made that promise? Um, my first, read my book when I write it. Um, <laughs> Very quickly, amazing, 64 Democrats voted for essentially the Hyde Amendment into the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare. First time it went through the House, there's a quarter of the Democrats, 64. You'd have almost none now. Um, it was complicated how we got there, and I was not going to vote for it. Um, it couldn't be changed in the law, and I think the executive order was fairly meaningless. The, even the language that was put into the Senate bill, which wound up being becoming the law, that said there had to be separate, two separate funds that the insurance companies held for abortion and for everything else, that was ne that's never been enforced. Uh, so e even what was in the Senate bill was not ever really I enforced. Uh, my question is for uh, Professor Gurgis. I'm interested in your 90% prediction. Uh, I have to say I'm uh, not persuaded. Um, and I guess my reasoning is I appreciated you going through the argument, you know, the paucity of legal arguments that might exist or maybe their weakness. Um, but I think you might be underestimating, I'll ask you whether you think you're underestimating the extent to which people have a capacity to rationalize whatever their priors were. Um, one of the things that <laughs> Um, that Roe did that wasn't mentioned was, um, I mean, it didn't just find or identify a right to abortion, but it also 
reinforced a long-standing convention of coming up with just anything to justify what we already wanted to do anyway. And there are an awful lot of Supreme Court cases and findings that are exactly that. Why would you expect that in this case in particular, they wouldn't just, yeah, you know, they might concede all of that, but just come up with something? Yeah, that's a great question. And you're absolutely right about the human capacity to rationalize. I know it firsthand. <laughs> um, so I, it, was, it was two things. So one is that, so my, my figure was 60% the moment they granted cert in the case. So obviously something brought me up from that. What was it? I was initially sitting down to write out a little piece about all the options that they would have and all the possible middle grounds they could write. And as I wrote that piece, I realized it's very hard to explain the case for any of those middle grounds. So obviously you're right, there's a gray area where people fudge it, but there have to be limits to that. Um, for, being forced to write an opinion is a constraint on judging. It's not a huge one, but it's something. So that was a matter of degree. The second thing is that everybody knows that Casey and Roe were making it up, but that gave the swing justices in those cases an extremely bad reputation among legal conservatives. So Justice Kavanaugh would have to be similar in the legal conservative mind of today to Justice Souter or Justice Kennedy or Justice O'Connor. And I just took it as a given that he would not want that. That's my, those are the two premises. So I think it's fair to say that Roe was one of a couple of cases in the 1960s and 70s that contributed to the creation of the conservative legal movement as a juggernaut in academia and politics. Do you expect that similar, a similar reaction might happen if Roe is overturned in terms of a progressive legal movement? Or do you expect that legal scholars, et cetera, who may be willing to admit in private company that Roe and Casey are making it up, would welcome the opportunity to sort of cut bait and focus on cases that give them a better shot? We have a, a little bit of initial indicate. A, it's hard to tell. B, to the extent that we have any evidence on that, you have started to see pieces. Ever since Kavanaugh gave his signals at oral argument, you've started to see pieces that say things like, by, by people on the left, pro-choice leaders. Um, so the, the woman who argued um, against the abortion regulations in Planned Parenthood versus Casey, and the woman who led the campaign for liberalization of abortion laws in Ireland, co-authored a piece saying, using the courts has not worked for us. It's gonna lead to a big defeat in the next year. We need to shift gears and focus on a more political strategy. Um, so to the extent that you're seeing pieces like that, maybe that's indicative and maybe, maybe it's not, we'll see. Can I ask a follow-up? Oh, please, Chris. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, it, we don't have time here, but there, there are some really big structural issues that sort of help explain why there's been such a powerful and, in, and important and consequential conservative legal movement, and we haven't seen the same thing on the left. Um, one of the easiest to say is, you know, when I was coming up in, uh, in the 1990s, the story was always that Democrats are always 12 years behind Republicans. Um, and that was direct mail. That was like, I mean, you name it. Like, just could not get there together um, as, soon as, um, as soon as the other party. I think the story on the progressive legal movement is very different and, and, and more than that, but it, it always sort of <laughs> is in the back of my mind. I, I, I wanted to ask, uh, so is it the progressives already have everything and the conservatives had to come up with something because they didn't have it? Yeah, I, I mean, I, so in, yeah. The, in, the law, yeah, in the law school context, the way this works is that the overwhelming majority of law professors are very socially progressive and progressive about how they want courts to work. So you get some, there's some push and some demand, basically, in economic terms, for a legal conservative movement, whereas, you know, if you're on the other side of those issues, that's just the kind of ambiance. So there's no need to, to gather. The gathering is the law school. But it's the threat again. That's right, right. right. A follow I actually up? have to go to a meeting, I'm okay. sorry. Well, Ask your follow-up. I'd like to hear the follow-up. Uh, is the conservative legal movement destroyed if Roe is not overturned? I, I think so. Um, the older uh, generations who are used to losing over and over on abortion are more complacent about this, but I think everybody under 45 thinks that um, we got to blow it up if it doesn't happen. Well, unfortunately, I'm no longer in that group. Um, but please uh, join me in thanking all of our panelists. <laughs>